We're here today with Mike Wittig, and I'll have him introduce himself. He's from a little company called Nike, <laughs> uh, in case you haven't heard of him. Sorry about that. No, that's all right. We appreciate your business, Gia. I'm glad you wear the shoes. Thank you very much. And uh, we're, we're here to talk to him today about uh, their shift to digital business. First of all, Mike, why don't you introduce yourself and tell us what you do for a living? Sure. Uh, hi, I'm Mike Wittig. I'm the VP of Infrastructure Engineering, uh, so all of the infrastructure components uh, for Nike. Oh, and by the way, I'm Gia Lyons. I'm with uh, Product Marketing at Puppet. So happy to be here with you today. So, you know, Mike, the, the theme today is all about shifting. So tell us a little bit about what shifts Nike's business has made over the last 10 to 15 years. Yeah, um, it's been substantial, uh, really driven by uh, the collapse, or maybe that's a little strong, the softening of the, uh, the wholesale uh, retail market. Um, and a lot of that is because people just don't go to the mall as much as they used to. Uh, and that has forced Nike to engage more directly with our consumers, um, either through our own retail stores um, or through Nike.com uh, and then our, our apps. I'm sure everybody's got the sneakers app and the Nike app on their phone, so thank you for that. Um, and it's that sort of engagement um, that is meeting people you know, where they are um, instead of you know, where they're not as much as they used to be inside those malls. So in order to make that transition, um, a couple of things have to happen. We've needed to become much more of a technology company uh, because the sales channel of our, our apps and Nike.com is the highest growth for the company. Uh, and traditionally, that's not how Nike thought of itself. Um, it was a product design company. It, uh, we were wholesalers um, and dealt in orders of 200,000 units that would go to a specific address because that was Foot Locker. Um, and now to be looking at 2,000 or 200,000 individual orders where you've got one or two different items that need to be shipped to a specific address, that has really forced us to change uh, our supply chain, uh, change the way that we do um, order fulfillment and delivery. Um, and it's, it's a really exciting time. Uh, th there's, you know, with that excitement is a little bit of nervousness because you know, a lot of people are used to looking at those wholesale sales numbers as the health of the company. Um, and so that generates a little bit of angst. Uh, but uh, all the work that we're doing to build out these new sales channels and to put technology into our stores and, and to revamp uh, our apps at Nike.com, those, those consumer direct sales channels, as we call them, um, that's really exciting work. That sounds fun. So as the business has been moving from the, the mentality of a wholesale manufacturer and design company into a consumer experience company. There you go. Right? Yep. Uh, how has that affected IT? Because you know, if, if there's any part of an organization that has institutionalized complexity, it's IT. Yeah. What was that like? Yeah, well, uh, it's been a, an interesting journey. I mean, really, uh, we've had to insource it, um, which is really fun because for a very long time it was outsourced and not just with one partner, but with a variety of partners. So there were people, many people, um, who were really just managing uh, contracts for different outsourced providers to do the work for us. Um, and that idea that we needed to have these direct sales channels be the future of the company and they had to be very technology based mm -hmm. meant we had to pull that work much closer to us. So uh, that means that we've uh, been able to, to hire a bunch of people and build teams uh, that have full time employees that have this technology expertise uh, and that's not something that Nike traditionally did for a long time um, and they really you know, relied on partners for that. Much the same way that we relied on wholesale partners for our sales channel and now we need to essentially insource those sales channels ourselves um, so we can uh, see the company continue to grow. Uh, but the technology change has been profound, uh, just even in the last couple of years, where we've had systems that have been in uh, third-party facilities for a very long time. Uh, in some cases, the, the lifespan of different components, so like Nike.com was always in that data center <laughs> the whole time it existed. Um, and, and we had to move it, and we had to hire people that would allow us to move it and rebuild it um, uh, in order to continue to go forward. So you've been bringing it inside, and how long has that been going on for the last? I'd say four years. Um, okay. Yeah, that's really when it seemed to start, uh, at least for me, um, uh, in, in a big way. Yeah. Well, I'm going to use a, a word, you know, transformation. We've mm. never heard of this one before. Uh, as the business has been transforming and IT has been transforming to support it, what kind of leadership have you seen from your IT executives? Are they, are they leading? Are they reacting? Yeah, um, 
Well, definitely leading, uh, and, and even more than the IT leadership, what's really uh, inspiring and helpful is um, our most senior leaders, our, our CEO, every time we announce quarterly results, will start with the most important thing we're doing is our digital transformation uh, and talk about the importance of technology to the growth of the company and the strategy of the company. So uh, that has led everybody else to then have to understand that we need to think of ourselves as a technology company. And there's been much more of a, uh, a reach out on the part of you know, our supply chain leaders, um, our product design and manufacturing leaders, reaching out to the IT organization to try to understand how they can be part of that transformation. Um, and that's been a big deal. I mean, even a couple of years ago, we were, it was much more pulling <laughs> to try to get some of those folks to engage. Um, and now that the message has kind of sunk in a bit more, um, it's much more of a partnership. How many of you in the audience are still in the pulling stage of, of getting your leaders to recognize and communicate from the top down that, hey, this is kind of important if we want to survive? Get a few, okay. Um, just, I, I just want to take an aside here. How did you get from pulling to getting those words into your CEO's mouth so that it's coming from top down for those of us who are struggling? Yeah. Um, well, you know, I, I think some of it was very numbers driven. Um, and, you know, if you look at that wholesale market, it's been going one way you know, for a while. So um, I think understanding that um, we needed to uh, shift where the growth was going to be. Um, and then, uh, you know, we're very lucky. Mark Parker, our CEO, is a very visionary guy. Uh, and, you know, he understands that we need to make this change in order to continue to see the company grow like that. Um, and you know, there's strategies that uh, have been very well articulated to our leadership team about um, the difference between uh, the, the number of sales that we see for people that are on our website anonymously versus the people that are a member and log in uh, versus the people that are uh, members of the Nike Run Club versus people that are in the sneakers app this many times a week. So to be able to see that the more we engage directly with our consumers, the more you know, they understand our brand and the more money they spend with us. Uh, so getting those numbers uh, communicated to um, all parts of our business leadership team helps a lot you know, for them to be able to understand, look, this is, this is a big deal for me. I've got to figure it out. You know, for a VP of infrastructure engineering, you're quite in tune with the business. <laughs> so well, thank you, Gia. Maybe that's a tip. Yeah, uh, well, <laughs> there is that, you know, and in some of it's just fascinating. I mean, it's, it's fun to learn about. Um, but also, you know, there is an element of trying to understand what our business partners need from technology, kind of okay. meet them with that language. And then, you know, if, if I'm interested in what they're doing and can talk to them in the terms that make sense for their part of the business, then they'll be hopefully a little more interested in partnering with us. I love that. Tell us a little bit about, I'm, I'm going to make it G-rated, that oh crap moment where your leaders went, oh crap, we actually need to do something different. We need to do it fast. Yeah. Um, that was, uh, <laughs> we've had a couple of those. Um, <laughs> uh, so um, maybe to, you know, to, to pick uh, a, a few. Um, so one definitely is around uh, time to, to market. Uh, so. Um, you know, it takes maybe, you know, 18 months from the time that someone's got an idea about this is what, you know, the new Roshis are going to look like um, until we've got those products out in the store that people can, can buy. 18 months is a long time. You know, a lot happens in that uh, amount of time, particularly around maybe the demand that was there for that idea when you first had it is a little different 18 months later when it's actually in the store. Um, so there is huge focus on how we can increase uh, the speed with which we can get these products out. Um, and also, the way that we gauge demand uh, needs to change. Uh, because a lot of that was, um, well, I'll say it a different way. The, the new way that we're looking to gauge demand is much more data driven um, and trying to understand what our consumers are telling us about what they want um, instead of um, the way that you know, perhaps we'd, we'd done it before. Um, so that's a, a current very uh, urgent thing for us is to try to shrink uh, the amount of time that it takes to get those products out. And we call that uh, uh, the, the, the express lane. Um, so try to get a few products that are going to get out in about six months instead of 18. Um, and then that also means uh, you know everybody's, um, at least in retail, uh, competing with Amazon and the expectations that Amazon set that after you order something, a drone's going to fly it down from the sky and deliver it to you on the sidewalk. And, three hours. So that's helpful. Um, and that's meant that we need to really change where we have product and where our distribution centers are. So one of the things that um, we highlighted over the summer 
with our new consumer direct offerings is this key city initiative um, and the idea that 12 key cities will see 80% of our growth over the next five years. Um, and so figuring out how do we change our supply chain to allow for next day, same day delivery um, in those 12 key cities. And then how do we engage with different partners like Foot Locker um, and understand the inventory that they have in their store. So somebody that you know, comes into one of our stores and knows what they want to buy, we never want to tell them we don't have that for you. <laughs> you know? um, and if we can then adjust that to be, well, we don't have it in this store, but you know, we've got that in a store that's down the road. And then to understand that that's not just a Nike store, but inventory levels at partner stores, that's hugely powerful. But that also requires a very different way that we look at inventory and a very different way that our partners engage with us to be able to share some of that data. Um, so that's another real big thing for us, inventory availability and then how we, how we present that. Um, and that's, you know, we're still going through that oh crap moment of, you know, how we, how we make that faster. As you try to get ever faster, because that's what it's all about. You heard Sanji this morning. It's all about accelerating delivery, whether it's a shoe or an app uh, or a service. What role has cloud and distributed infrastructure play mm. in your transformation? Yeah, a big one. Uh, so one of the, the challenges that we, um, well, the puzzles we get to solve um, is, you know, we have a few moments throughout the year where our, our demand is very different. Um, and so we've got, you know, Jordans that we launch every week. Uh, and, and some of those are um, a little more, um, generate a little more excitement than others. Um, and, you know, we've got a few moments, you know, the, the AJ11 uh, that, that we launch um, in, uh, in December each year, that's always the biggest moment. Uh, so. What we did uh, previously uh, was <laughs> gauge that moment. How many, how much traffic did we have on the site? What kind of capacity do we need for the hour and a half, maybe three hours that it takes to sell, you know, 100,000 pair of shoes and put all that capacity on the floor? <laughs> and then it sits there looking at you, you know, for the rest of the year where you're not really using it very much um, because we'll go from, you know, like 9,000 hits a minute to like 300,000 hits a minute in those peaks. Um, and so uh, being able to have the proximity that we've got to both AWS and Azure and then rewrite the tools that, uh, the, the ways that our consumers place those orders, which is essentially the sneakers app, um, that allows us to auto uh, expand in you know, the hour before you know, those big moments happen and then shrink it down uh, to steady state after those big launches are done. Um, and that's been a, a massive change for us, uh, but that's, that's a hard thing to do. Uh, you know, we had to rewrite um, a lot, almost all of the applications that uh, provide that experience or all the different services within that app that provide that experience. And then to be able to uh, try to take advantage of the existing stack that's still on-prem to say, what do we really need to rewrite in order to be able to burst out to handle those orders? And then what do we not have to rewrite? Uh, an order management system, as an example. Uh, the order capture system, the shopping cart, that really needs to expand out when you've got that much traffic coming in in a short amount of time. The order management system that's going to receive those orders and then send it to the distribution center, not so much. So what that means is we can be very selective about the stuff that we have to rewrite and put that into AWS or Azure and then use the existing stack as a series of endpoints that those applications can call so we can Im improve the, the time to market by not having to rewrite everything, but just the stuff that's really important for those big moments. And as you're doing these rewrites, how are you applying DevOps practices and automation? Yeah. Uh, so. Uh, <laughs> the DevOps thing is interesting. So um, a lot of you know a lot of excitement about that. Everybody likes to talk about that. We're DevOps, baby, you know. And then then the application colleagues you know get the phone call when their stuff doesn't work, and then sometimes they don't like it so much. Um, but you know the idea that uh, you know the folks that are building um, the applications would then build them with an eye towards the supportability of them, and then have that improve the quality of the code that they write, definitely. Um, and and that's, a, that's a big thing for us, because we had an awful lot of um, you know, throwing stuff over the fence, you know, like, hey, we're architects, man. We just designed this stuff. We're not supporting it. We call those people cartoonists if they just draw pictures, <laughs> but they don't actually build things. Um, so you know, and what, what I like to say to my application colleagues is you know, we've got a term 
an infrastructure for DevOps, so we call it every single day. You know, I mean, that's just the way we've been. <laughs> um, so I'm glad that you joined the party. Uh, so there's, there's a, a, a very healthy practice to have people that are designing and then building and then deploying stuff also support it. And that's what I think the real component is for DevOps. Um, automation, uh, you know, a couple of things. Um, you know, I've talked about it before, uh, that being able to automatically uh, deploy and then destroy development environments is a huge deal. Um, and it used to be that these uh, pre-production development environments that were copies of, of you know, Nike.com that our developers would use to test stuff before they deployed, man, you, I mean, changing those things uh, was almost impossible. It's like, don't change it. <laughs> it takes six months to rebuild this stuff. We need it. Otherwise, we can't deploy code. Um, well, the problem with that is if, you don't, if it sits there all the time and you're on, making these changes and then deploying stuff and trying something else, a lot of cruft builds up in those environments. And then you kind of start designing or developing around issues that you don't really have. It's an issue that you've got in your development environment, but it's not a real problem. So the way that we have been able to automate the uh, deploying the infrastructure and the applications and then the test data to populate those development environments, that's been a game changer for us. I mean, we do that stuff, we can do it in a day, uh, whereas before it took six months. And to see our development colleagues uh, initially, you know, come to us to run those commands to rebuild and destroy those environments and now do that stuff themselves. So we're really not involved with it anymore. It's just the way they do it. They produce better code and they're able to turn things around more quickly because, you know, if you completely destroy that development environment and then redeploy it, it's much cleaner. Um, and so that, that's been a real big deal. And just one more thing on automation that the way that that's shifting for us now is much more around automating uh, operations. Um, so initially that was really around provisioning infrastructure and provisioning applications. The next big thing for us is understanding how we can use, um, you know, machine learning to, uh, you know, pull logs in from, you know, backup servers and say, you know, hey, these backups are always supposed to start at around 6 o'clock. Uh, this backup, uh, it's 618. It hasn't started yet. Let me go reach out and see if that thing's healthy and restart the backup agent. and. Boy, I know that you know that machine runs an important batch job that starts in 92 minutes, but the last 10 times this backup has run, it only takes 28 minutes. So I'm going to safely restart the backup. Even that little example right there, that's a huge deal because it would it takes so much time away from engineers that should be doing other stuff. And if we can build a model that can just do that, um, not only does that improve you know that backup process, but then you can replace backups with OS patching or replace it with deploying software. And then all of a sudden, you've got a model that you can use that improves a whole series of things. Um, and that's really, we have that opportunity because of the standards that we've been able to drive you know, within the infrastructure, within our tooling, uh, with, you know, obviously with partners like you guys. Um, so we're trying to understand how we then advance that concept of automation beyond just what it's been for us over the last couple of years. Something you said that I want to ask our, our uh, attendees, how many of you are still at that, yeah, if only dev would listen? Uh, and I don't mean that in a pejorative way, but. It can be a pejorative. OK. That's OK. You know, they're all about hitting that release date. How do I, you know, but there can be a better way. We can work better together. How many of you are right there right now? OK, so did you have like backyard barbecues? Did you invite people to your children's birthday parties? How did you get them to? There was a little trust? bit of that. I mean, I had some people okay. at my 40th birthday party that were there for diplomacy reasons. You know, that, <laughs> I, I definitely did that. Um, and, and, and that stuff helps. You know? uh, I, I think also, okay. you know, it's, um, at least in our journey, uh, it's building credibility. Um, and okay. I think um, if you are uh, trying to understand where they're coming, I mean, it's you know, a bit of empathy. I try to understand where they're coming from, try to have like, a, a consistent track record to, to be able to deliver on it. You know, one thing for us was, you know, tearing down those development environments. I mean, people thought we were nuts, you know? Um, and, and then trying to show people, hey, look, we really can do this in about you know, a day, and it'll be much better for you. And then that moment when they were like, yeah, yeah, okay, we don't want to come to you anymore, just we'll be able to run the commands and do the rebuild ourselves. I mean, that was, that was massive. Uh, because, you know, even a, a year prior to that change happening, um, it was, you know, it was contentious, as it can sometimes be. 
Um, but yeah, I think it's just a little bit of momentum. You know, find that one thing that you can focus on to make it a little bit easier, and then you kind of build that that trust, and then from there, you know, things kind of start to open up. Kind of start out with what's in it for them. Yeah. Let's get a quick win and tell everybody. Yeah. Got it. I mean, or you know, another, a question I remember asking one of my application colleagues: What's the worst thing about engaging with my team? <laughs> you know what I mean? And then they were very honest, uh, and they're like, okay, all right, that's enough. Just one. I said just one thing, <laughs> you know? And then let, let's pick that and try to make it better. You know what I mean? And so that, that, that helped too. That's good. Yeah. Okay. Before we open it up for questions, uh, something interesting has happened. Uh, you've like had, right now? Well, also that. Right. But okay. in your recent past, right. uh, you've had success in re-architecting and rebuilding Nike.com, and we're going to call that Greenfield. And it was. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So your leadership team said, this is fantastic. Could you also go do our brownfield? Thanks. Yes. Tell us what's the same, what's different, what has is, what is surprised you, what is, what is making you cry in your, your pillow at night, right. or jump for joy. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, OK. Uh, that's Because they are two different things. I mean, the reason we had the opportunity with, um, with, uh, with Nike.com to do Greenfield is that the site just couldn't stay up. Um, I mean, it was falling over. And it got to the point where we were just, you know, duct tape and bailing wire to get through one holiday run and then be like, all right, look, it's just, if we get the additional people coming to the site to buy this stuff next November and December, it will not stay up. So then that sort of created this existential crisis that then got much more than just the technology leadership to say, look, we've got to do this. Um, and, then, uh, and then we had the support, which was great. Um, for the Brownfield stuff, um, I guess part of the, the reason it's still Brownfield is it hasn't been that bad. You know, I mean, there isn't that like existential burning platform type moments. Right. I, I do. I tried to create one. I tried to kind of <laughs> hype it up a bit and be like, "This is terrible. We've got to redo the whole thing, just like we did the other time." And they were like, "No, it's really not that bad, and we're not going to go through that again. So you're going to have to figure it out a different way." Um, so you know, we've had to do it piece by piece, um, and you know, pick uh, a couple of big applications that are at the center of a much larger ecosystem, and you know, unsurprisingly, SAP is one of those. So getting SAP onto a platform that is much faster and is more modern and uses the same infrastructure components and tools that we use for Nike.com, that simplifies uh, a lot of things. Um, and uh, you know, a, a trophy I've got in my office is um, the, <laughs> the labels for the two of the Superdomes that we shut off when we moved uh, SAP onto um, a, a, a Linux-based platform that matched what we've got for, for, uh, for the rest of the, the Nike.com stack. But you know, that, that's a big deal. Um, and then you've kind of got to do it piece by piece. So we've had to do an awful lot of um, understanding uh, how these applications talk to each other, because we don't have a lot of people that really natively understood that. I think that's a byproduct of having technology outsourced for a long time. Yeah. You don't really have a lot of people with you know, that institutional knowledge of how the apps work. So, um, you know, for us, it was uh, uh, put tools on the network that can show us how the computers are talking to each other. And then from that, try to understand, OK, this app needs to be within 20 milliseconds of this app. So they've got to go together. These apps over here are just doing file transfer batch type stuff that isn't very latency sensitive. That's a different group. So it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a fun puzzle to solve, but it's definitely, you have to be a little bit, uh, approach it differently than, you know, when it's just, you know, Greenfield and get to build everything new. You know, that's a good point. Uh, and that might just be the next frontier for implementing DevOps practices and automation is it's, it's, it's not, it's easy now. It didn't used to be, but it's kind of easy to uh, justify it if it is customer facing, if there is a direct correlation or causation to revenue yes. or customer experience or customer satisfaction. Now, you know, we, let's go into the basement and, uh, <laughs> yeah. like, you know, this generator's 20 years old, and we've, we've got to have everything keep pace. Yep. That makes sense. Yeah. Uh, one last question before we're going to open it up yeah, for, sure. for questions. Uh, we heard today about the journey to automation and percent automated. What are your thoughts on, on that journey, and where do you think Nike is right now? Yeah, so... Um, with the automation of um, you know, deploying or you know, provisioning infrastructure, deploying applications, I, I think we're, we're in a pretty good spot um, because we've been able to leverage an awful lot of the work that we did a couple of years ago when we did that Greenfield replatform and then put more applications into it. I mean, we're certainly not all the way there, uh, but we know how to do it and we've got more applications that move into that framework um, each week. So in that sense of automation, uh, I, I think we're in a good place. Certainly more work to do, but it's much better than it was. 
with uh, automating operations, you know, that backup example that we talked about, um, we are nowhere. <laughs> um, you know, we are, I've got, you know, we've got this idea and we're talking about it and why won't this be great? And now we've got to figure out how we're going to build it, you know? Um, and that is just a, a massive opportunity. That, that's, that's my new favorite part of the job is thinking about how we can build that framework, start to take a couple of use cases, because you can kind of blow your mind when you start to think about all the stuff you can do. And then, and that's happened in a few of these meetings. It was like, and then we're gonna do this, and then six months later, we, this is gonna be, you know? And it was like, <laughs> stop, <laughs> you know, we're talking about backups, <laughs> you know what I mean? Let's get, let's get back here and focus on that real example. Um, so, you know, that uh, is, is a huge deal for, I mean, you know, we've got still tons of money in offshore contracts to manage those sort of operational tasks. I mean, I'm sure a lot of people do. And to think about how we could start to get some momentum to replace those ITO contracts with that self-healing machine learning capability and then be able to take that, uh, those dollars in those ITO contracts and then reinvest them in even more functionality you know, in that same platform. You, know, you, can, you can see how we could drive the, the, the self-funding uh, component of it and give money back at the same time. Um, but you know, it's all about that first one. So we gotta get the first one off the ground and, uh, and then it'll be good. So for me, I think um, what I really wanna do is to have that first use case um, live and, and just uh, really cranking you know, by next October. Um, so uh, yeah, that, that's our new task. We'll see how it works. Sounds fun. Now I yeah. can sit here and ask you a ton more questions, but we'd like to open it up to the room here. Uh, would anyone like to ask a question? Just raise your hand and we'll get a microphone to you. Thanks. Um, so in your shift to a digital business, um, Nike is not just dealing with the shifting retail space, but you're also involved now with apps and collecting health data, uh, dealing with customers. I wonder if there are any specific challenges in that, uh, doing that, which, which seems pretty a field for what was an apparel company. Yeah, well, great question. Um, it's a huge deal, uh, and we're doing an awful lot with um, the, the DPA, the Dutch Privacy Authority, um, to uh, make certain that we're understanding and abiding by those rules. Um, and you know, capturing data like even height and weight, uh, certainly heart rate, um, you know, that has a whole new uh, connotation and requirement for privacy than anything we've ever done before. Um, when we were just you know, cranking out sizes and colors and you know, category lines. Um, it's, uh, so we've got a, a much larger data privacy practice than we've ever had before. Um, and folks that are understanding you know, that, uh, that very fluid field of what you're supposed to do with the data. Um, and you know, right now, well, we're going through changes uh, that we're trying to get done you know, before November, is that's, you know, November, December, all we do is make money. <laughs> you know, we can do the technology stuff up until that point, but can't really do any changes in those months. Um, so uh, specifically for that, um, that example with uh, collecting you know, health data. The other thing is um, to see you know, kind of the balkanization of the internet um, in terms of where countries pass laws that require you to store data in certain locations. Um, you know, the World Cup next summer is in Russia. Uh, shortly after uh, FIFA made that decision, um, Russia passed a data privacy law that said all data that you hold about Russian consumers, Russian employees, Russian contractors, and Russian job applicants needs to reside primarily in Russia. And that all traffic that goes to your site uh, needs to flow through a pop in Russia. And you need to provide a kill switch. So if the Broskomnadzor, who's their equivalent of the DPA, feels as though you're not abiding by the law, they can flip the kill switch and shut you off. And then they even went further and said, if we flip the kill switch and it doesn't shut you off, then we deport your GM. And I met the GM. He's a very pleasant, sort of nervous um, Slovakian guy, you know what I mean? Who was like really interested in how we were building this solution to make sure that we could do that. But you know, there's no cloud providers in Russia, you know what I mean? Like Amazon's not in Russia, Microsoft's not in Russia. So we had to go build our own thing. Um, and now, you know, China passed the new data privacy law on June 1st. I mean, it's a really ever-changing field. And you're right, for a company like Nike, we've never really had to think about that stuff. But we really do now because, um, you know, those, those laws are very serious things. Another question? 
You mentioned that there is this strong drive by Nike to move very quickly. So I hear speed and increased customer engagement. I'd like to know how do you achieve that without um, creating new risks? You're moving very quickly, then there's security risks that pop up. And by integrating these systems, how do you address um, risk from a holistic view and down to um, the application specifically? Yeah, yeah, great question. Um, the size of our information security team uh, now compared to what it was two years ago is, I mean, it's massive. Um, and uh, the tooling that we've deployed to try to understand uh, and, and consistently scan and listen to uh, not only uh, the applications but our full network, um, that's also been substantial. A huge investment uh, in that tooling to try to understand uh, what's happening um, with uh, our whole ecosystem. Um, and, you know, so that, that's certainly one type of risk is just, you know, that daily uh, unwanted traffic, you know, to try to get in and, and see what we're doing. Um, the other type of it is, and it, I think you touched on it too, is the air traffic control of trying to change so much stuff at once, make sure that one thing doesn't step on something else. Um, uh, and that's, that's tricky. Uh, you know, we've got um, a lot of uh, maturity around our change and release management teams. Um, and it took, uh, you know, recently, you know, we had many of those teams. Um, it, maybe the glue between them wasn't as strong as it could be. So you could go through one approval process and everything would be signed off and happy, but you'd have a, another group of people over here that didn't know anything about it that would then be negatively impacted. So it took a while, but we've, we've merged all of those change and release management teams so we can get that single view. Um, and that's helped a little, uh, but it's still, uh, it, it's tricky. I mean, there's an element of it that still comes down to personal relationships and, and just knowing people and talking about what you're doing. I'm like, wait, what? You're changing that on that day? You can't do that. <laughs> you know what I mean? So there's, there's still an element of, of that sort of, you know, shoe leather to try to just go out and talk to people and understand what's going on. But we're trying to get to the point, um, you know, we still have multiple service now instances, for example. So getting to the point where we've got one of those so you can really get that single view um, so you can really deconflict the different stuff that you're doing, but it's tricky. Um, most of the companies uh, uh, today uh, and uh, mention DevOps as kind of a vogue, kind of a, a term. And many years ago, uh, a big company uh, sell that kind of deal: developers, developers, developers. <laughs> and most of the times. Uh, operation and securities uh, don't kind of fit of it. H how was the strategic part since uh, Nike.com is a retailer, stores credit cards? How you manage the strategic part from PCI, KFS, and those kind of compliance stuff in the DevOps model in the modern way? Kind of yeah, thing? yeah. So um, uh, for PCI specifically, because I think that'll, that'll highlight some of the other examples. Um, Moving to, and it's not necessarily DevOps, but it's kind of related, moving to that product model where we've got a product owner who's responsible for payments um, is a really big deal. And to have that product owner then you know, manage the backlog of the engineering teams that are rolling out changes to our payment systems to be able to prioritize, hey look, this EMV liability shift is a real thing. We've got to go out and replace all these payment terminals to make certain that we can comply with it. Um, that has really changed things. And getting into that model where you've got somebody and a team of people who are responsible specifically for you know, payment or specifically for data privacy, um, that's helped hugely. But it takes, it, 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 we, it, we needed to kind of not get in trouble, but um, kind of freak ourselves out a bit <laughs> about how w much we weren't doing that to make everybody understand we needed to get into to that model to make that happen. Um, and. You know, we're, we're also lucky in that uh, Tim Cook is, is on our board. He's our lead director. Um, so there's a lot of close ties with us and Apple. Um, and uh, they have been able to uh, kind of show us the way on some of those components, specifically around retail and risk and, you know, getting uh, into different countries um, in a way that's been very helpful. So I think it's, it's also trying to, and, you know, saying something obvious, but it's, it's worked really well for me. When I'm struggling to, communicate a concept or try to get people on our business leadership team to prioritize and understand the importance of something, 
referring to how other companies that I know they admire are doing it <laughs> is, all, is very helpful. Um, and, and being able to show them that, look, this is this published case study, or I've talked to this person at Apple and they're doing it like this, that usually the lights go on in a slightly different way when if it's just me trying to pound the table. There's a question there. Right behind you. You get to work out those shoes a little more, man. There you go. <laughs> How are you dealing with the uh, network services configuration management, especially the ones who change frequently, like firewall policy changes, load balancing, proxies, et cetera? And are you still, um, you know, in some way, uh, dealing with uh, other teams who need to provide that service to you in a way that is not very aligned with the DevOps way of doing things? Yeah, so, um, man, I'll tell you, one of the biggest uh, mistakes that I've made um, and, and really reflecting on it over the last 12 months is I was very late to connect how moving to much more cloud-based or SaaS-based services would put a huge strain on my traditional networking team. Um, and now uh, one of the things that I'm spending a lot of time on is building out that core networking capability um, or adding to it. Um, and, you know, we've got uh, three main locations, um, you know, Portland is one, uh, Amsterdam, or just outside Amsterdam, uh, and then Shanghai. Um, and what's great about those spots is they're all beautifully kind of nine hours apart from each other, so you can build out a follow the sun model, you know, where you can hopefully attract and, and retain better talent because people can go have a life after work and confidently move what they were doing to, you know, the, the other team that's going to, you know, pick up the dials. Um, and we're spending a lot of time adding capacity to our networking team uh, in order to keep up with the fact that, you know, a whole bunch of apps that were all on the same layer two network in the same data center forever um, are now dispersed, you know, to a variety of different partners. And, um, you know, one of the more, one of the scarier moments is when, you know, I'm talking with one of my application colleagues or one of my product colleagues and they are kind of offhandedly remark on, oh yeah, so we just you know move this other component to the SaaS-based service. It's working really well. You did really <laughs> okay. Well, that app talks to at least two different apps that I can think of. Where is this other network that you've moved this application to? You know what I mean? We've got to be able to keep track of these things. So we've come up with this idea that we call Steel Threads to try to understand a couple of really important business flows and what the applications are that are involved in. Um, in that business flow, sending an order to a factory, executing a buy um, of the, the products that we're going to uh, put into our, our factories and then put into our stores. And then if you look at all the different apps that are really involved in that, now they are very distributed. Um, and, and some of those networks aren't ours at all because they're SaaS providers. So uh, that's a real challenge um, and, and trying to make certain that we can stay on top of that and try to be very thoughtful about how we move applications or data sets to um, not just public clouds, because that's a little more straightforward because we've got the direct connects in the data centers uh, that we've built out globally to do that. Um, even in that case, he's got to be sure you keep track of what VPC you're in and what kind of address space you're using. Um, you know, we've definitely created some trouble for ourselves there. But it's really that move to more SaaS-based services that, that really complicates that. Um, so yeah, it's a, you're spot on. It's a, it's a really big deal. Other questions? Anyone else? Questions? If not, Mike, I've got one for you. OK, here we go. Uh, so you have a room full of IT leaders here in front of you. Uh, what parting advice would you offer to folks in the room as they look to lead transformations and adopt more of a DevOps way of working within their organizations, if you yeah. could leave them with one thing? Yeah, sure. Um, I think it's, you know, it's, I'm trying to say it in a different way, but um, it's failing me. Find that existential crisis. <laughs> Not that you want to go looking for a crisis, but, you know, find the thing that is so important to your business and your company's future that you can tie to the technology change that um, will then allow you to, as part of that move, do things like DevOps or get to a point where you can drive more automation. Because those things by themselves, you know, you'll lose a non-technical person immediately. Um, but trying to 
understand what it is about the future of your company's growth and how that is technology generated. I think it was last year that Sanjay had that, uh, that view of the Fortune 100 companies and, and how that had changed over, I think it was 10 years or whatever it was. 52% fell off. Right, yeah. and, and then and he said, and it was very insightful, that the ones that stay are, are the ones that understand they need to be technology companies in order to stay. Um, so that could be a way to do it also, because again, uh, in my experience, uh, a way to get uh, business leaders to pay attention to changes that need to be made is to try to understand what companies they admire and try to make a change through the context of, look, these other people that we know we want to be like are doing this, so we should really pay attention to it to try to make this next big leap in the way that you know, we're going to grow revenue or you know, be able to expand or whatever it is that's important for your individual business.